financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vani Podcast. And welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. That is, at least when you get to the action portion. <laughs> Nonetheless, I'm Shane and... I'm Kyle. You're strange. <laughs> Very strange. Although I guess, I guess the, the variety is uh, uh, maybe, maybe entertaining for the listeners, Ver- I don't know. Variety is the spice of life. <laughs> Very good. Well, we certainly we're, we're certainly glad you decided to join us today, and we we hope you've had a great week. And uh, Kyle, why don't you go ahead and uh, bipcot this thing for us? Since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals, the Vanu podcast is covered by a bipcot no government license. Reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at bipcot.org. Well done. Well done. Uh, but yeah, I added that little uh, that little uh, beginning part to the uh, to the license to make it you know unique to Vanu and all of that with uh, you know invul- invulnerability to coercion and all that good stuff. But uh, <laughs> very good. Uh, this episode is entitled "A Primer on the Servile Society," and the show notes can be found at vanupodcast.com forward slash nine. So let's get right into this. And since you're in the I guess you can call it the hot seat uh, this week, uh, <laughs> uh, you're uh, Mr. Definition Man. So uh, what's uh, let's go ahead and define some terms first. Uh, we'll define. Uh, servile society, import export, and one directional is- isolationism. So, Kyle, what uh, what is the servile society? I guess you could say that a uh, servile society could be defined as one that does not respect self ownership or individual liberty, but rather heralds the supremacy of government and authority. So, in other words, it upholds the collective as superior to the individual. Um, If you think about it, every aspect of the servile society is oriented towards unmitigated subservience towards those, shall we say, malfunctioning individuals who falsely imagine themselves to be our rulers. So regardless of the specific flavor of authoritarianism, I think it would be fair to say that a key recurring theme of the servile society is that blind obedience to the state is considered to be a virtue. Very good. Yeah, that's uh, (laughs) uh, what about uh, import export? Well, I guess the short, concise, and sweetly put way of putting it is that import-export is a way of concisely explaining how uh, Venuans, defined, of course, as those who have an invulnerability to coercion, uh, relate to the servile society. So uh, to maybe explain this a little bit more, the import part of it would be that they are importing knowledge and goods, perhaps other things as well, into their venuums, the place or situation of an invulnerability to coercion, like their shelters of one kind or another. Home bases, yeah. Mm -hmm, Sure. And that itself is kind of its own topic, right? Uh, But they're importing (laughs) goods and knowledge and perhaps some other things, and they export their labor as well as, whenever they get around to it, uh, products back out to the servile society, especially if they... uh, have like a home-based business or or something to that effect. So import export is the idea of importing goods and knowledge and exporting labor and products. Yes, yes, and we'll, we'll get more into this in a moment. But I, I think it is worth mentioning here that 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 the reason Rayo kind of formulated this was because it, it's very very hard, especially you know early on. Uh, it's, it's, it might might even be impossible to you know uh, as as he kind of did you know move out in the woods and uh, living under a, a polyethylene a tent. Uh, I mean, it, very, very hard to, you know, be completely self-sufficient out there. So, you know, importing and exporting with the servile society uh, is, is is kind of necessary, uh, you know, uh, in, in regards to Vani. So uh, what about uh, one directional isolationism? So one directional isolationism, I guess you could say, is how import-export actually works. So one directional isolation of import-export is used to maintain access to the servile society's shall I say, open but not free trading centers, yet simultaneously denying them access to a Venuan's home through, again, importing goods and knowledge while exporting labor or products back out to the servile society. So if you think about like the old uh, English common law adage of a man's home is his castle, 
that's kind of a very simple way of understanding one directional isolationism. So to also kind of use a parallel example regarding legal interstices, people are familiar with search warrants and stuff that that's kind of like a legal interstice in, in a manner of speaking. Again, see previous episode on that. Um, again, with one directional isolationism as part of Vanu, which is about practicality, not legality. The idea of import export is how do you actually maintain that one directional isolationism to keep out coercers of one flavor or another, you know, Maybe one particular way of doing that in terms of hardening your home would be maybe having a security set up or, or some other things. But at least in terms of import-export, it's a way of conceptualizing how the new ones can be the new ones and have integrity in doing so while still maintaining trade with the servile society and yet not compromise on their principles. Indeed, indeed, and well said. So, Wayne, as, as, as we do in every single podcast, it's important, it's important to look at uh, what Rayo actually said uh, about the concepts that we're, that we're presenting uh, here in uh, the Vani podcast. So uh, we'll start with this one. Quote, an optimally liberated lifestyle must involve a sort of one-directional isolation. The liberator maintains his access to their open but not free trading centers while denying them access to his home. This requires a skillful blend of concealment and deception, plus perhaps elements of mobility and deterrence. A free man obtains information, techniques, key equipment, and supplies out of the servile society, exporting labor or products in return. And during import-export activities, he practices deception, perhaps carries a driver's license, genuine or faked, perhaps pays some sales taxes he cannot conveniently avoid. But the free man's home base is physically concealed. There he spends most of his time. There he may sleep and buy, love, design, build, trade with fellow freemen, and raise children in relative safety from the savages of state. A free man's home must be a figurative castle, end quote. And that's from October 7th. Or that uh, article is written in October 7th of 1970 uh, in page 15 uh, of, uh, of uh, Rayo's book. So I guess let's provide some examples on what, what, you know, what a home base would, would look like. Uh, so I think a, a, a home base, and, and obviously we'll get more into as we, you know, uh, provide some, some examples of, you know, more... I guess, productive home bases versus, you know, um, ones that are, are more for like re relaxation. So, you know, comfortable living versus like industry uh, and things of that nature. But, uh, but Kyle, I think Aurora and Alongside Night uh, could serve as one example. So uh, if you haven't watched the movie, I'd recommend you go do it. It's, it's, it's uh, free on YouTube. But uh, uh, you'll notice they have early warning systems. I remember one time in the movie when, uh, you know, they were, you know, uh, they were uh, vulnerable to coercion. And what did they do? Well, they had uh, an early warning system that alerted all of the occupants. Uh, and the, uh, the the traders in the market that uh, yeah it's about time to uh, you know uh, jump ship uh, as as I said uh, and they had their secure home bases too I mean that's where they lived so uh, they were secure they had a a, a system to uh, you know uh, get them out of there safely and uh, they they did have uh, uh, you know light to heavy industry I mean it was it's essentially like if if you envision a shopping mall uh, that's kind of the uh, kind of what it was so it wasn't you know. Uh, 500 by 500 uh, square foot tiny house. This was like a pretty massive, you know, structure. Um, so this would be more more like a light and heavy industry in Rayo's Mean Time to Harassment Spectrum, uh, which we'll we'll discuss next week. So just kind of table that for now. But Kyle, what do you think? Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely a example taken straight out of libertarian fiction. And uh, Aurora in Alongside Night was just was was pretty much. It was carried accurately, you know, from the actual novel that, of course, I wrote a book report on, obviously, as these things go. So, yes, when when in there was an event, not to spoil the plot too much, but just to describe the context of this scenes so that uh, the listeners can really understand what was going on in case they haven't read the book or watched the movie Alongside Night by J. Neil Shulman. It's just simply this. Um, the statists found the underground market or a underground market, this particular one being codenamed Aurora that was trading in all sorts of stuff that let's just say it's just a little bit black market, uh, obviously uh, nuclear weapons and shit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and there was cannabis and there was all sorts of things. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're talking like multiple life sentences, if not a death sentence, if anybody was caught and convicted. Okay. Let me put it that way. And I don't think juries are going to nullify anytime soon. Um, but yeah, you look at Aurora and, you know, it was, it was kind of like, well, an underground shopping mall in a manner of speaking. And there was also, it was, a, it was a pretty interesting complex. Like there was like, uh, there were dining areas. They had uh, their own like anarcho bank type thing. I think it was called, uh, their own mm -hmm. currency exchanges. 
they had kind of almost like a YMCA type complex with like gyms and saunas and uh, swimming pools. Actually, one of the gym areas was kind of segregated off because there was actually a, a, an orgy actually going on in one of them. Um, not everybody was participating, of course. And uh, there was the uh, kind of the kind of like the hotel section, which is where people were like sleeping and and then, of course, doing other things that, of course, men and women naturally do when they're alone with each other. Just keep this PG-13 uh, any more so than it already is. So, yeah, like with Aurora, uh, that's kind of a very interesting example of like a larger uh, venuum of sorts, uh, because they it was I mean, even the construction of Aurora was very much. Uh, done pretty pretty discreetly with like multiple with like multiple uh, contractors, and this was described by one of the uh, members of the Agorist Revolutionary Cadre, well, the liber the the libertarian you know propertarian anarchist um, uh, people basically conducting uh, tra counter economic trade and such. So yeah, Aurora was actually a very interesting, albeit fictional example of of that kind of thing, where they did really have a one directional isolationism uh, with the servile society. Indeed they did. Indeed they did. Uh, let's move forward to uh, uh, another excerpt from, uh, from Rayo's book. Quote, The higher maximum of satisfaction is attained by someone with a liberated home base, plus some import-export with the servile society. For him, contact with the state is an occasional annoyance and danger, not a big part of his life. Thus, he can avoid the psychological paralysis that afflicts so many nonconformists. Compared to the opportunistic serf, he may enjoy somewhat fewer conveniences at present, but is happier overall. On the other hand, he has more than someone living in a primitive isolation required for 100% freedom, uh, end quote. And that's uh, written, uh, same article, actually, no, not same article, November, November 17th, 1970, uh, page 18 uh, of that book. Uh, so any, any thoughts on that one? I mean, it kind of, uh, I, I think one, one note that kind of comes to mind in this, we, we talked about this in our Controlled Schizophrenia episode, but, you know, constant, you know, be, being, you know, immersed in, you know, the, ser the state of servile society, uh, you know, as he said, psychological paralysis. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, the 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 importance of the uh, status, uh, you know, uh, of import export is not only, uh, you know, being able to survive, you know, uh, um, if you if you kind of emulate radio and go live out in the woods uh, or whatever. Uh, it's not only you know just the physical survival part, but it's also the psychological as well. Yes, it is, and also consider the various uh, collective uh, movementists, collective movementism. See previous episode. Uh, consider also the political crusaders. Again, see previous episode on that topic. Uh, they, I mean, those guys have their own psychological paralysis, don't they? It's not just the controlled schizophrenics, right? True. Yeah. So definitely. Yeah, it is. It is a little bit more widespread, and much like I said in I, at least one of those episodes, my own personal. Um, uh, <laughs> former conflicts. I like to think I have it under control now, but with the news cycle, because I, I've admitted before that I'm a former news junkie. So that being a news junkie was my form, my own personal form of having a psychological paralysis. So when Rayo mentioned this in 1970, and then I read the, and then I read his book, you know, not too not too uh, long ago. I think it was last year or thereabouts. Yeah, man, like. He was really on point. I know a lot of our episodes were constantly saying, man, Rayo was really right about things. I think we've only disagreed with him a few times thus far. But yeah, right here, psychological paralysis that afflicts so many nonconformists. He nailed it on this one. I mean, it, it's it's like freaky accurate, but in a good way. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> and it definitely is, uh, definitely is accurate. Uh, we, we've got quite a few to get through, so I'm going to go ahead and get to this next one. Quote, freedom is not a monolithic entity. There are various degrees but not all degrees are necessarily viable. For most people, I suspect that choices between predominantly servile, vulnerable lifestyles and predominantly liberated and vulnerable lifestyles. Uh, in quotes, uh, that same article, uh, November 17th, 1970, page 19. Uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, because this, uh, let's see, there's one other one I think here that's, that's closely related to that one. Um, okay, maybe not, maybe not. But uh, any thoughts on that one? Yes, I, I think that's that's kind of an interesting dichotomy that I think the listeners should uh, take to heart and then consider whether they think Rayo was was accurate about that or not. I personally think he was accurate about the you know predominantly servile or vulnerable lifestyles versus predominantly liberated or invulnerable lifestyles. I think the dichotomy is a real one. 
And it does explain quite a bit. In fact, there was also another quote, I'll loosely paraphrase because I'm doing this off the top of my head, where Rayo made a comparison about can you really uh, sympathize with somebody who built their house on like loose uh, soil or sand, I think was what he said, on loose sand, as opposed to someone who built his, uh, his house on a firm foundation of rock or something to that effect. And yeah, so yeah. what he was kind of getting at is that people voluntarily make lifestyle choices in such a manner that actually does affect the likelihood of whether they're going to be coerced or not, you know, later. And that is something, mm -hmm. see, that's kind of get, getting at the root of, you know, how, how do I put this? Okay, I, I won't say this nicely then. How personally responsible is someone for the tyranny that they experience, whether from the state or from private criminals or, or whomever? Because a lot of what you do, especially early on in your life, sets the stage or, you know, increases or decreases the likelihood for whether you're going to, you know, find yourself in the bad part of town, proverbially speaking. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that, that that's that's definitely true, and I mean, I I I agree, I agree with you, and also him that you know I it, I think it is that that dichotomy is actually accurate, uh, because I mean, yeah, you can be free or you can be a slave. You can't be a free slave. You can't be a slave that is free, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so so I I think this one, I'm, I'm not a big fan of dichotomies. I know you aren't either, Kyle, but um, but but with this, I I, I think this one is very very accurate. You cannot be free slave. <laughs> right, and uh, for any of the listeners who may disagree with me on this point. My email address is kyle at vanupodcast.com. Yes, it is. And mine chain at vanupodcast.com. <laughs> very good, very good. Um, so uh, moving forward, quote, we believe primitivism would mean less vanu in the long run. Primitive societies run afoul of bloodlands sooner or later. Consistent avoidance of something requires some knowledge of it. And there are too many capabilities, things we wish to develop, which require equipment, materials, and knowledge out of the other society. Technology our society doesn't have yet, but personal travel isn't necessary for import-export. All that is needed for now is a way to get parcels and messages in and out, interfaces with the freighting and communication services of that society, end quote. Uh, and that was March 1972, page 81. But I think he's, he, he's exactly right again. Because you consider, uh, consider, consider the, uh, um, the, the black market entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, as uh, as, as uh, Ray would call them, like, you know, ethical enclaves, uh, or Samuel Konkin, you know, agorism. Uh, just consider, you know, if if, if agorism or uh, agorism generally, uh, or you know, just individuals that that practice agorism were, let's just say, you know, uh, uh, primitivist, primitivist. Bitcoin and you know, cryptocurrencies are a great tool to you know the black and gray markets. And uh, without that technology, I mean, they would still you know have to you know use uh, Federal Reserve notes, barter, and things of that nature. So uh, what Ray was kind of arguing here is that you know the technology is a good thing. You know, technology can help you become more more uh, uh, you know closer to uh, vulnerabilism. You know, becoming invulnerable invulnerable to coercion. So uh, the, the import export of that uh, is, <laughs> I mean, yeah, to to, to develop Vanu further. Uh, you know, the technology can be a, a great great help and. And yeah, I mean, uh, if you're living out there in a polyethylene A tent, uh, you know, with uh, with your food storage and uh, as Rayo with his typewriter, I mean, uh, it's going to be really hard to you know come up with these uh, these really really intricate technologies like uh, like Bitcoin uh, or some of these altcoins or encryption, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that there's still a necessity for these servile society uh, as far as you know developing Vanu uh, and you know surviving. Right. And just because the transhumanists want to, you know, Im uh, surgically implant brain chips between the hemispheres of their, well, brains, doesn't therefore mean technology as a whole is some sort of insidious, uh, you know, entity or whatever, right? I mean, technology is a double-edged sword, isn't it? It can be used for good or it can be used for evil. It, technology itself is neutral. In many ways, not to get too praxeological on everybody, and oh, by the way, I have been reading Ludwig von Mises' Human Action, okay? So if, for, for some reason, this is on the top of my head, of course. But, you know, <laughs> money is neutral. It's just a tool. You can use it to either uplift people or you can use it to basically, like the state does, basically squish them down into, uh, into dust and, well, use it for coercive purposes, right? Yeah, you, and and you can you can use a hammer to you know build a house, or you can use a hammer to bash someone's skull in. I mean, the hammer is there's nothing good or bad about the hammer; it's just a tool. Right, and so I think one major problem we keep seeing over and over again, at least I do, is that the crypto anarchists, in particular, really get a bad rap when they shouldn't. Really, I mean, 
it's it's I think it's just kind of obvious. And and although I have my own, you know, very limited critiques topic for another time regarding issues of like security audits or free and open source software, that in itself is just something that can be remedied, right? And that's something I've kind of written on before in some of my other articles and such. So but if you look at the crypto anarchists in general, I think there's a lot more positive than negative on the whole because their whole thing oh, yeah. is basically use technology and more specifically use digital technology to basically liberate the individual from the shackles of the state and especially the surveillance state in particular. So I don't see why anybody really has that much of a problem with the crypto anarchists, but they do, whether it's a crypto anarchist like Cody Wilson or even people who weren't necessarily crypto anarchists, but just like more hacktivist types like the late Aaron Schwartz, who, of course, pioneered the whole notion of open access, which is what many of us bloggers and podcasters kind of rely on. So when you folks... That's, that, that's what that's what the Bipcot license that you guys heard at the beginning of the show is based off of. It's it's essentially Creative Commons, only, you know, taken, you know, applied to the state, too. <laughs> yeah, and so, for example, when you folks, you know, come go to vanupodcast.com and you can look at the articles that are there, which are sourced with hyperlinks, and you can, you know, grab these podcasts and whatever else, all of that is open access, there's no paywall, and you can thank men, not boys or children, but you can thank adult men like the late Aaron Schwartz, who would have been about 30 or so had he survived and not committed suicide due to federal per persecution, because he was being coerced by government, of course. Um, it was him and others like him that pioneered a lot of this technology that now a lot of us take for granted. I don't because I know how important and significant it is because I study this stuff and I, you know, learn things and such. And I encourage the audience to do that as well on their own time. So, you know, man, I don't know, technology being a bad thing? Who said? Really, honestly. You know, unless they're doing like forced microchipping or something, which would of course be done by government, the state, in terms of like forced microchipping, unless it's something like that or something along those lines. I don't see technology being a bad thing, but technology in that case wouldn't be bad. It just be would be used for bad purposes. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you you're exactly right. You're exactly right. And uh and, and Ray will also recognized the importance of technology. I mean, um there were there were some parts in his book. I mean, he, he kind of predicted the uh the the occurrence of, of, of cryptocurrencies. Uh, uh he mentioned, you know, underground banks, you know, uh, with uh with with credits. Uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of people argue that cryptocurrencies aren't actually money. It's just you know data being exchanged, uh, which was kind of what uh, what Ray was was referring to in, in his book, which is which is mind blowing. Uh, and the 3D printing too. I mean, the, it obviously not now. Uh, there's still it's still got to be developed. I mean, the technology it, it's, it's expensive when it comes out, and then it gets cheaper and you know more widely used. But 3D printing could be a great tool. Uh, but the primitivists, you know, those folks who uh, you go who live in the middle of the woods and have no contact with these state of servile society, are going to be uh, a little uh, outmatched. Uh, if, if they aren't already, uh, so technology is is definitely important, and uh, that doesn't I mean not not to say it can't be you know developed uh, uh, in in your uh, Vanu home base. Not to say it can't, but uh, I mean when you consider like the uh, the the ingenuity of hundreds of millions of individuals uh, in this uh, ge ge geographical location, more commonly known as the United States. I mean. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's a lot of technology that you would not ha not have access to, and, and you know technology that could very much so uh, increase your your, your pursuance of Vanu. Yeah, and I would just kind of you know on on this point, you know, because obviously this was would, might be more appropriate for season two, but just consider this as a parting thought regarding the technology question. Would it be accurate to say that technological innovation in the collective, or shall I say, the long term aggregate? that technological innovation more often than not actually benefits the individual more so than not i would say i would say general generally yeah but i think what yeah we'll, we'll i think we'll, we'll probably cross that bridge you know uh season season two or season three uh, but that's definitely an interesting question and one's uh, and one that I, I recommend you know the listeners kind of uh, think about and consider until we get to that point uh yeah definitely definitely a good uh, a good question something good to bring up so uh this next quote here quote in one sense, such a free man cannot be completely free since his import-export is restricted. Neither would be a resident of a utopian free country who traded with someone in Russia or America. Import-export is easier for extraterritorial freemen than for residents of another country since controlling millions of square miles of interior is vastly more difficult than thousands of linear miles of border. 
In either case, with growth, import-export becomes relatively smaller and more in the hands of specialists at border crossings. The liberated home freeman, unlike the conventionally living libertarian, can segregate import-export from the rest of his life, essentially for development of durable, growing, joyous, free mini-cultures, end quote. Uh, and again, that one's from October 7th, 1970, page 15. So, Kyle, that kind of gets into the realm of, you know, country shopping. Uh, but here he is uh, essentially highlighting how import-export can make you, you know, more vulnerable than not, uh, which is kind of, kind, of, kind of what we've been hammering home so far, uh, you know, just kind of at the beginning of this podcast. Uh, but yeah, country shopping could be very, very beneficial. I know we talked about, you know, making your money in, say, America and, you know, spending in the Bahamas. Because if you're just spending, if you're spending in the Bahamas, I mean, uh, uh, if you're spending your money there, I mean, uh, less likely to, uh, to, to to coerce you. And I mean, since you didn't make it there, you don't have to, you know, pay income tax on it uh, or, or anything of that nature. So uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on this one, Kyle? I would just simply say that, yes, if you have a more developed import-export, I think it would be, you know, more... In a utilitarian sense, it would be a lot more easily usable, you know, over time once it gets better developed and all that. And again, when we get to season two and we get into self-seeking, okay, sailboats, <laughs> that's part of it. But when we get into self-seeking, even if we're not country shopping, which is the international stuff mainly, even if we're sticking to this portion of the North American continent from this latitude and longitude to that latitude and longitude, because that's what actually exists in reality, not America, which is just a political concept, sovereignty and all that. <laughs> uh, suffice it to say, man, yeah, I mean, if you whether it's the self-seeking version of like the local congregations or maybe even intentional community or, or one of those other things we'll cover in season two, I think it's rather interesting that even here, it would seem to be the case that, yeah, if there was like a, a growing concentration of, of the new ins or other types of libertarians or what have you, that, yeah, import-export would be easier, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely, without a doubt. Div actually, division of labor—I'm oh, sorry, not to get praxeological again—division uh, of labor, wouldn't it, right? Uh, yeah, specialization yeah, and, and of labor, I know too. And I know Rayo talked about uh, he like he uh, to, like towards the end of uh, you know the book uh, later on uh, in his in his development of, of Vanu, uh, he did mention he's like I've got quite a bit of money to spend and there's things that I'd like to buy, uh, and there are you know things I'd like to trade for services. But unfortunately, that's just that's just not here yet. Um, so so yeah, I mean uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, having having more folks who are who are who are Vanuans where you can you know trade uh, goods and services with, oh yeah, that can that can definitely assist you. For for example, like if you're going on the sailboat route. Uh, and you uh, you have a, a nice little uh, you know mini culture, uh, Vanu mini culture, and you need uh, repairs on your sailboat. Uh, you can go to a fellow Vanu, and you don't have to you know go to like uh, uh, you know some status outlet uh, who's going to you know, like you know, require you to pay taxes and such. So there's there's a lot of positives that come from uh, you know uh, have, have having others to work with. Yes, absolutely. And so I think that's just kind of something to kind of keep in mind, everybody, is that. The import-export, at least for the immediate foreseeable future, is going to be somewhat limited in the sense that there's going to be a greater dependency on the servile society in the immediate future rather than uh, later, where presumably if there was a growing uh, number of Venuans and especially more concentrated, shall we say, enclaves, okay, where then there can be a division of labor and labor specialization where some Venuans would specialize in import-export, leaving other Venuans available to do uh, other things, right? Um, not to get too into economics here, but for those of you familiar with Ricardo's law of comparative advantage, like real free mm -hmm. trade, for those of you familiar with the law of comparative advantage, that's exactly what I'm getting at here. I'm just applying comparative advantage not to these ridiculous, redundant, outdated, coercive nation states, so-called countries. I'm talking about law of comparative advantages as applied to individual human beings trying to become invulnerable to coercion. Okay, That's what I'm kind of getting at. So for now, for the immediate foreseeable future, import-export in a lot of ways – is a way of trying to maintain survivability despite the servile society, despite the state. And, and I'll, I'll mention one other thing here. And we've been talking about you know the vanus many cultures, but um, but but like let, let's just say I mean that doesn't you know unfortunately uh, you know uh, um, individuals at least where, where where you where you you know choose to vani like let's say there's just, there's just not uh, any other individuals uh, like you. Uh, that's that's okay because uh, one thing Rayo kind of experienced is uh, that's a, like uh, one, once you uh, uh, obviously like early on you make more trips to the state of servile society 
And then once you get better and uh, you get better at food storage and, and things of that nature, depending on what route you go, I'm just kind of speaking speaking about Rayo's uh, path right now. You can you can make less and less trips to the Cerebral Society. So let's say you you make one big trip uh, one big trip a year, and you have everything you need for the rest of the year. And the rest of that time, you're no, you know you're just uh, uh, maintaining your uh, home base and you know doing whatever the hell you want to do. Uh, so it doesn't require the people uh, necessarily, um, but but just the, you know improving upon your import exports can can you know uh, definitely increase your your invulnerability to coercion. Uh, and also, I mean, just your overall happiness, too, which is more of a subjective term, and I don't want to kind of, you know, tie that in here, uh, too. But I, I know, for me, if I if I could, you know, not, uh, you know, go into cities uh, more often, I know it would, it would definitely, you know, improve my improve my standard of living. Yeah, let me let me just add on a personal anecdote before we, before we keep going on here. You know, every single time the wife and I go to the grocery store here in town, right here in Austin, for me personally— and maybe other people will disagree with me about this. It's it's depressing as all hell. And it's not that things are getting worse. It's not like they've installed naked body scanners at the grocery store or something. Okay. That would be bad. <laughs> okay. And I'm not I'm not saying I and I know the conspiracists would friggin' love stuff like that because it would give them, you know, fodder for the news cycle or whatever. I'm just simply saying stuff like that isn't a reality, at least not yet. It's it's just I guess I, I guess I kind of feel like Rayo might. It's the culture. My toler to sound like Rayo because he mentioned this in, in in part two of his in section two of his book. It's just my tolerance for their servile society is getting less and less. I am quite literally growing more intolerant of the servile society the longer I live, and so even being physically around them, like in the environs. Let me just paint a quick picture before we continue. Like, even being in the aisles with that horrible lighting and the gosh gall darn awful music. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. It's, you know, I've been in, this is going to sound awful and all the free market people are going to hate me for saying this. I have literally been in government buildings with better surroundings. Okay, a better uh, atmosphere that was calmer. Okay, and, and less frenetic and less... Um, I don't know, man. I mean, maybe it's an issue of aesthetics. I don't know. It's or maybe it's the particular grocery store chain. I don't know. We've we've actually tried some different ones, and to be fair, thankfully there is a free market in food production, so we actually do kind of move around a bit. And I would say some are better than others. It's just I don't know, man. I I think I think it's an issue more of like social norms, at least to some extent. I, I mean, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I know maybe some people would say, "Hey, get out of Austin. It's a blue area." Some people have literally said that to me, by the way. As if, as if the voting, the politically crusading color of the week or whatever is what matters. It's like okay, and I could also be in friggin' Portland, Oregon too, or I could be in like pick. I don't know, man. I'm starting to think that maybe you know it's these urban areas, or at least some of them might might be you know. I mean, if you really think about coercion. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't really coercive areas, if we're going to divide them up geographically, isn't like a lot of coercion like happening in the cities? Yes. Yes, it is. And that I, I want to read this. We'll, 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 we'll silent that for a moment because we're going to come back to it right after this quote um, but by Rayo because it fits in perfectly. So just st stand by for one moment here, Kyle. Uh, quote, more and more people are rejecting the attitudes and roles of the servile society. While only a small minority of the whole population, they number in the tens of thousands. Some attempt to turn back the clock by moving to farms or small towns, but rural dwellers are conspicuously unfree. So those who really want freedom will search in other directions, end quote. And that was from Sep September 1972, page 92. And to answer your question, uh, yeah, the majority of people, yeah, they, they, live, in, they live in cities. And uh, I've mentioned, uh, you know, in other podcasts and things, maybe in this one too, I don't remember, I don't recall off the top of my head. But my, I guess my, my next step after, you know, I, I kind of, you know, continue forward in the uh, frugality and financially, ind financially independent early retirement path, uh, what I want to do is, you know, move down to, we own some property in Southern Illinois. And, uh, uh, you know, it's probably, you know, I don't know, 15, it, there's, there's a small town about five, five minutes away, but it's, uh, it's, it's like a town of 50 people, uh, no police force, obviously. Uh, unfortunately, they, uh, they're they a bunch of uh, rednecks on welfare, which is not good, and they, they have a lot of Hillary Clinton signs around there. Not that that really makes a big difference, but just, just an observation. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to I move out there. I want to move out there. And 
Uh, yeah, unfortunately, there would be you know property titling and all, uh, which which uh, which would be you know uh, un unvanu, uh, according to Rayo. But uh, but yeah, as, as you kind of said, Kyle, uh, considering where p physically most people live and you know where the bludgies hang out, you know those police extortionists, moving to a rural area automatically makes you more invulnerable to coercion. Uh, you know, lower crime rates. Uh, you know, again, less bludgies, no bludgies out there where where I want to move to. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll broach those other issues in season two and three, but I, I don't know, man, even with the property titling, I mean, in, in the 25 years, I've been going down there for 20, almost 25, but they, uh, my parents have, have owned property down there for 25 years. There's never been a cop, never, ever. So I think automatically moving to moving out of the cities makes you more invulnerable to coercion. What do you think? I, th I think that there is a general tendency towards that way. I mean, maybe there are, are exceptions to that. And again, if you like to send what you might think are the exceptions to that, my email is kyle at vanupodcast.com. But seriously, man, I, I just, I know that Rayo says here the one sentence about, but rural dwellers are conspicuously unfree. And all I'm thinking is based on what, man? I don't know. I'm I'm not 100% on this, but I'm leaning towards Rayo might be wrong about that one specific observation. Because I don't know, dude. I mean, there are off-grid homesteaders right now. You know, people who aren't, who don't, you know, have sewage. People who aren't plugged into the electrical grid. People who don't have cable. The issue of internet is interesting. I don't want to get too in the weeds here. Some people have internet, some people don't. And usually they have to either bum off either the Wi-Fi or they have to use satellite internet and pay for that. But generally speaking, there are off-grid homesteaders right now. And the interesting question is, would something, for example, like off-grid homesteading make you more or less vulnerable to coercion? And for whatever reason, Rayo is kind of making an assumption. And to be fair, okay, he's talking about like in the 60s and 70s, okay? And I'm talking more about off-grid homesteading now in the 2010s, okay? So there is a there is a time difference. There's a sec technological difference. Okay, and that's to, to be to just. I'm, I don't want to nail Rayo to a cross here, just for the listeners. I just <laughs> want to keep in mind, Espe here. especially in, especially not on that like one minor point. Yeah. Yes, yeah, go ahead. but I I would say now in the 2010s, uh, I don't know, man. The off grid homesteaders have their own challenges because of the kind of thing that they're trying to pursue. But in terms of like vulnerability to coercion. I'm leaning more towards they're more likely than not to be invulnerable as opposed to, again, I mean, in, in terms of like the geogra um, in terms of like population density, uh, I don't know, would you rather be a country mouse or a city rat? And, and, and you, you make a good point there because like obviously whatever lifestyle choice uh, you decide to make, if you decide to pursue Vanu, uh, they're, they're all going to come with their own set of challenges. Uh, living in a city, uh, you're going to you're going to deal with, you know, the, the psychological aspect. You're going to deal with, uh, you know, more uh, more government, uh, uh, more more government agents. Uh, and if you live off grid, you're going to have to, you know, figure out, uh, I mean, if, if like uh, if, if one of the ways one of your passive income streams is, you know, like a blog with advertising. Uh, you're gonna have to find a way to get internet. You're gonna have to find a way for for power and all that stuff. Um, they they all just come with with, with different sets of challenges. Uh, now I, I will say I will say this, and this is an anecdotal example, but uh, going going down there to to our property, and you know for the past you know twenty almost twenty five years of my life, I uh, I mean obviously the the first like five years don't really count, but we'll just go with it. I. I have noticed, Kyle, that the, that the, the the I guess the the country folk that that I've I've known for forever they they tend to they tend to be more happy they tend to be uh they, they tend to be you know a lot more friendlier because they they don't deal with you know the the, the assholes that uh, that unfortunately I deal with on a daily basis uh they you know they they don't they don't uh, you know get people out there often so when we when we go down there uh, we're we'll all be next week they're just happy as all hell to see us and they're just the, the nicest folks. Uh, and, and you don't really get that a lot in the obviously there, there are exceptions. This isn't this isn't this isn't you know a hard rule, but generally, I mean uh, uh, people that I meet on public aren't aren't generally friendly. Uh, so I, I think that that's more of the psychological aspect too. But uh, I, I think that there, there definitely are some benefits, even if Rayo, you know, he he does point out some 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 issues, you know, with with purchasing private property and stuff. But uh, I, I do think generally, you know, moving out to a rural area. Uh, is 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 uh you know is, is definitely a beneficial thing and it definitely makes you more invulnerable to coercion, uh, at least at least in some regards. But any, anything else on that, Kyle? I would just simply say this: uh, when it comes to the servile society, 
most of the inhabitants of said servile society as a matter of fact, according to the CIA World Factbook, it's something like, what, 80, 85 percent of the total American population is urbanized? So most of the inhabitants of said servile society, I guess you could say mainstream America, are city rats. Okay, that's very important when we're trying to make decisions about, you know, trying to increase invulnerability. Okay, so even now, obviously, when we get into season two and there's going to be the issue about doing Vanu in the cities, which is something I'm looking forward to in particular, because I think it can be at least an alternative to off-grid homesteading or uh, perhaps even parallel to it. Maybe some people could bounce back and forth between the two, right? I mean, the dichotomy between city rat and country mouse, there's also the third option of why not do both. We'll get to that in season two. I just think it's rather interesting that when you consider the servile society's inhabitants and the coercion that they can inflict upon you, remember, it's not just about the bludgies, okay? You also have to consider snitches, informants, provocateurs, like the provocateurs in Portland, Oregon, just the other month, where they were blocking by, by, traffic. Violators, violators of property rights. Yeah, they, I mean, were, blocking, yeah, I mean, yeah. they were blocking traffic. Literally, and it was, and I, and, and in terms of legality for people who care about that, it was actually illegal for them to do so. And the cops didn't, the bludgies didn't even come along until like hours and hours and hours later to, you know, clear the roads and such so that people could like get home from work because this was going on for hours and hours and hours. I mean, that's how friggin' lawless they are. Okay. That's, I mean, so the coercion doesn't always come from the state. The co coercion can also come in the form of organized crime syndicates. Or as the case was here, disingenuous activists blocking traffic. Yeah, yeah. And let me bring this back to, uh, you know, import-export real quick and kind of just make one note in regards to, you know, rural living. Obviously, depending upon how far away you are from a city, you might not be able to find, uh, uh, you know, a 9-to-5 job. Uh, or you may have to travel, you know, quite quite significant, you know, uh, significantly more distance to to get to those. Um, it, it'll kind of, uh, at least at least for from from for my you know my my you know projected path, I'll have to become a lot more self sufficient. Uh, and I think that's I think that's a good thing. But uh, but again, uh, the, the import export as aspect may be a little more difficult uh, the further you away are for the further away uh, you are from a city. Uh, but again, uh, the the more uh, the more Vani you become, the less uh, you'll have to interact, uh, and the less you'll have to you know uh, import and export. Uh, so uh, uh, I guess Kyle, anything else before we move on to this uh, this final quote, which you kind of already paraphrased a little bit, but I'll, I'll read it anyways, uh, uh, just just for the sake of the listeners. I would I would just say this: when it comes to the servile society, it does include the state, but it's not limited to it. So you have the state. And then including that but going beyond that into more the realm of, like, culture is the servile society. And Venuans are specifically against the servile society. So in terms of import-export, that is a way of trying to provide for survivability of us who want to be invulnerable to coercion, or shall I say pursuing Venuans, you know, in the process of achieving an invulnerability to coercion. Import-export allows us to pursue Venuans. In a way to where we maintain our integrity. Sorry, I don't mean to me. We right. We did the collective movementism episode, right? <laughs> where I and others like me uh, are basically trying to preserve whatever integrity each one of me, us. Damn it! Uh, see, plural pronouns are, are can be really kind of annoying. Yeah. Whip, whip, <laughs> whip, whip. Right? Okay. We're no, uh, no. It's 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 understandable. I mean, yeah, I I notice it, but I, okay, I think but yeah, we, we've we've already done that. Okay, yeah. so so the import export is basically a way for us to maintain our integrity uh, while still surviving despite the servile society. So if there's any one takeaway from this particular episode is that it. Um, is that it's, it's import export has a very utilitarian function while also being philosophically consistent because we're not bowing before the servile society. We're specifically against it. But until we have better infrastructure and the venuums grow larger to the extent where we have things like an aurora or things similar to that, but it's real world, not just some, you know, something from libertarian fiction. Uh, until that time, import-export is going to be uh, quite important, and it's not going to be as well-developed as, well, I personally would like it to be. 
Indeed, indeed. So let me read this uh, final quote uh, real quick. So, one who continues in a vulnerable lifestyle and then complains when he is plundered is somewhat like a West Indies resident who builds a flimsy house and then blames the next hurricane for demolishing it. Certainly, people are to blame when they inflict coercion, but merely blaming them does not bring liberty. The self-responsible person builds a home which can withstand likely storms and develops a way of life not vulnerable to likely attempts at predation, end quote. Uh, and again, that's from his November 17th, 1970 article, uh, page 17. And this does represent the, 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 the servile society. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, uh, we kind of mentioned the collective, collective movementism thing and uh, the political crusading. You know, there are plenty of people complaining about, you know, the lack of freedom, right? But are they, are they really doing anything uh, to, you know, increase their own personal freedom? Uh, obviously, the political crusaders go political crusading. Uh, the uh, collective movement, uh, movementism folks, uh, kind of do the same thing, or they don't, and they just they just fail for for other reasons. But these people are th these individuals are willfully choosing to be more vulnerable. Uh, now, no one's forcing them to stay in the cities. No one's forcing them uh, to you know uh, uh, run for office. At least not yet. Wouldn't that be weird? Oh God, please uh, no. <laughs> uh, but yeah, th th it's a choice. It's a choice. Uh, and, and as we've kind of been saying, you know, that throughout the the first. Uh, uh, non episodes of this podcast. I mean, uh, that lifestyle choices uh, are are very important, and uh, they can you know determine whether whether you will you know live free as a Vanuan or whether you'll you live as a slave in the survival society. Now, I don't like putting it that way, but uh, uh, but it's just it's just you know cold hard truth. Uh, it, it just is. Unless you're going to Vanuan cities, which uh, that one may sound a little confusing. If you read the if you read the book, you'll 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 kind of understand where I was coming from. But Vanuan cities may seem like an, a, an odd concept, but uh, we'll definitely develop that further. But anything on that quote, Kyle? Yeah, I would just say this. When you look at uh, those individuals who make up the servile society, they really are good Germans. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, good Americans. Oh, wait, hold on a second. I actually did mean it. They are good Germans. And people really should feel insulted when they hear that, especially coming from me. Because there is a historical connotation about what a good German was. You know, people who actually supported the friggin' National Socialists, who were socialists. The ones, the ones, the ones that sent the uh, sent the uh, the individuals into uh, gas chambers and such. Yeah. Or or whatever else. I mean, I mean, I know some people have their own issues as to what actually happened or didn't happen. I will just say this: the National Socialists, who were socialists, because people keep forgetting about that, which is why I emphasize it. The National Socialists terrorized men like Ludwig von Mises, okay? Yep. They murdered people, uh, murders, democide, that's not contested, okay? So when people praise the system as it is, the Anglo-American empire would be one way of describing it. Other people call it the New World Order. Pick a phrase. We're pretty much describing roughly the same thing. They are basically good Americans, which is basically the modern version of being a good German. And you people are good Germans, and I have nothing in common with you because you worship the servile society, you praise the state, and you basically are heralding quite literally the extinction of the human species such as it is. And and just to add one clarification, Kyle's not talking to you, the listeners, the Vanu podcast. He's just uh, he's talking generally. <laughs> Sorry, I should have made that disclaimer. I, I, know, I, I know I know quite a few of you that that listen, and uh, yeah, you guys aren't doing that. So just just add a, a point of a point of clar clarification, a little little bit of monologuing or or, or, or or however you would put it. But but yeah, he's not talking about you specifically. He's he just he's just talking. Although I will <laughs> although I will add this as a secondary disclaimer or at least a notice of sorts for those of you you know good listeners and such who are at least giving us the time of day if not also agreeing with us, at least to some extent, I would suggest that you probably should look around at people that you're associating with and try to, well, gauge as best as you can using your own judgment whether they are good Americans, the modern good Germans, and basically just try to evaluate, are they really good Americans? And then, you know, hopefully you'll maybe find some, I don't know, what's the opposite? I mean, what would we be? Maybe bad Americans? I don't know. <laughs> Well, hey, if, if that if that's what it is, I'm 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 proud to be a bad American. <laughs> yeah, you're a ter you're a terrible American, Shane, and that's the nicest compliment I'll ever give you. Indeed, indeed. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, essentially what Ray was trying to get across there is that uh, yeah, people people choose these lifestyles, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, they they can't uh, when, when they when they decide to oh I don't know uh, live in a city and and, and you know. Uh, advocate for the state and and a bunch of other you know terrible things they they, they can't uh, you know complain whenever the state actually comes and gets them 
Uh, I mean, you you, you don't uh, uh, like, for example, just just use just may, maybe it's a bad one, but you can tell me if it is, Kyle. But you know, starting a uh, legal business and then uh, you know complaining when the government comes for tax dollars, I guess it might might be might be one example. I mean, you can't really complain about that, right? No, because they went and um, they submitted before authority, right? And I understand yeah. that they're being coerced by laws and such, but you know. You know, I wrote a separate article on this. People can look at it if they really want to. But the notion of carefully calculated submission and the very short version of that is that if you do decide to obey the laws and not just the laws generally, but like a specific one. OK, the key part is not so much the submission. It's the carefully calculated part in that you choose to obey a specific law because you have well carefully calculated uh, that it is in your own best interest to do so at this time. Maybe later you'll disobey it. I don't know. I mean, that that's on you, okay? And that goes right along with uh, with, with what Rayo discussed, especially with, you know, the legal interstices of, uh, of the van nomadism. But yeah, go ahead. Exactly. And so that's kind of something interesting a lot of people really don't think about. So without getting into legal interstices too much, what I'll just simply say here regarding the servile society is that generally speaking, yes, in twenty in early twenty first century America with a K, quite a lot of one's personal life, even professional life to some degree, right, is voluntary by and large. Even despite the federal government and the several state governments and so forth, generally speaking, a lot of your life is voluntary, right? We're uh, we are not uh, exactly like the kulaks or or Soviet citizens, although there are actually way too many accurate comparisons, to be perfectly frank with you. But yeah, yeah, like like you you and I could leave America if we wanted to. Uh, like we 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 could leave love it or it. leave at, it. This at at this point we could. Uh, now uh, if 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 that wall gets built and you know uh, uh, immigration continues to be built up, I mean it might be a little more difficult. But uh, but anyways, yeah, hey, go ahead. Hey, that, that's Ludwig, a subject for another time. Ludwig von Mises. <laughs> left Austria when the National Socialists were welcomed in by the good Austrians, who were exactly like the good Germans of their time. And Mises was like, holy crap, I'm trying to talk about free markets and, and money and trade and like living in peace oh, and prosperity. They'll, holy crap, I gotta get out of here. They'll put my head on a pike. <laughs> yeah, it was probably a good thing he did leave because he was not he was not like a gorilla, and it's probably better that he did choose to leave so that he can go and write books and stuff, like Human Action, which came out after the war. OK, you know, Ayn Rand left the Soviet Union, OK, when she could, came here to America all by herself. And Mises and Rand, you know, their first language was not English. She spoke Russian. I believe he spoke probably German, right, being an Austrian. So, yeah, that's kind of interesting. So when all of these disgusting political crusaders of one flavor or another tell us to love it or leave it, I have a better idea. Why don't they leave? And yeah, I know them's fighting words. I know that. That's not the point. The point is that they're good Americans, the modern good Germans, who revel in the, in the servile society and are trying to coerce me and my fellow peaceful men to basically lick the boot and kiss the ring. And I say, no, enough. It's time to have our own second realm of our own infrastructure and our own culture preferably a culture of liberty, or Vanu, if you will, and, uh, and and push that forward. Because quite frankly, Shane, nobody is coercing anybody to watch the Oscars. Nobody's uh, coercing anybody to watch a stupid football game. People make choices when they engage in, in so-called cultural activities like that, don't they? Yeah, definitely. Without a doubt, yeah. Yeah, and just yeah, speaking for, like the, uh, for, for the NFL specifically, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of statism there. Uh, and they and the uh, obviously you know you consider the uh, stadiums that get a lot of taxpayer taxpayer money and then uh, the uh, the the other government money so that they you know promote the worship of the state so yeah yeah it's you're definitely uh, you know uh, uh, stand th things for like the that national is... anthem yep. oh say can you put us in prison we are political prisoners okay okay excuse my bad singing <laughs> but okay I'm I'm kind of going off the cuff here but but seriously I mean. It's just like, look, guys, I was a Boy Scout, okay? I've been there. I've done that. I have quite literally worn the uniform and earned my way up through the ranks, okay, without getting too much of my own personal life. I've been there. I've done that. It's not a pretty picture at all. There is a reason I have a, dis a specific disgust of conservatives, 
I don't like progressives either because they're, you know, they're good Americans too. But conservative, I mean, let me put it this way. The progressives will impoverish you and put you in the poorhouse and make you homeless and unemployed and such. But the conservatives will just enslave you, incarcerate you, and even kill your ass. And so if we're being honest here about coercion and trying to become invulnerable to said coercion, which is what Vanu is all about, I think it's also pretty, it's time to get pretty honest here about the servile society and how really dangerous it is to be surrounded by literally hundreds of millions of people on this continent who, if under the right circumstances, would be willing to snitch on you without batting an eyelash. So there was a reason why yeah. Rayo kept mentioning about you need to vet people, you need to have something resembling a security culture, and you need to be uh, – and you basically need to you know, – how did El City put it, Shane? I'm trying to remember. Like give up these dreams of like worldwide utopian free societies and get with each other mm -hmm. in our little Venuums and Vanuist mini cultures, to loosely paraphrase it. There was a reason yep. Rayo was getting on that because I think he understood much of what I just explained to you all. Yeah, yeah, and I guess I'll add one more anecdotal example, and then we'll we'll kind of kind of get to close out here. But uh, yeah, I was in high level indoctrination, you know, as ORS in the state of Servile Society. They call that college, uh, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, high level indoctrination. Yeah, I, I, I went there until uh, until just uh, December of 2016, and uh, I'll tell you what, uh, being around uh, psychopathic socialists uh, who you know want to uh, uh, who want to you know further the uh, the extortion. Uh, of my property, of my labor, and, and the fruits of it, and uh, I'll tell you what, it was very, very tough. the The only, the only, I think, the only way I made it through, at least as far as I did, until I thankfully, thankfully stopped, was largely my uh, adventures in Illinois higher education uh, series that I, that I that I wrote uh, on that. Uh, it kind of helped me keep my helped helped keep my sanity. It it really did, and also you know reading reading Human Action Kyle uh, there and there in uh, in class uh, definitely helped as well. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, th there's something to say about, uh, you know, limiting, even, even if it's not, uh, you know, to, to the point of Bonnie, so to speak. But um, as, 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 as we've kind of talked about before, cutting ties to the state is good, and then cutting ties to the servile society is good, too. Um, so if, uh, like for me, one of those ties was, you know, high-level indoctrination. And, uh, you know, I, I stopped, um, stopped that, and uh, I've... I've a lot, a lot happier. Well, a lot, uh, a lot, a lot less stress. A lot less stress. Uh, now I do have, you know, a nine to five job, but uh, politics is not discussed there. So uh, it's, it's gonna, it's a, it's a world of difference. There are no, uh, you know, uh, uh, vote for, vote for uh, Hitler, vote for Stalin, vote for uh, <laughs> Gary Johnson. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. So uh, it's, there's something, something to be said about cutting those ties to the survival society as. Uh, as you, you, you very well could and, and I would say probably should do uh, in regards to the state. Hold on, let me actually just point out something you, you just highlighted. You're already doing import-export, aren't you? Just with how you exactly... So actually, let, let's as we begin to class out here, let's actually you know use what you just said as a perfect example. You're not talking about politics at work, but you are exporting your labor so then mm -hmm. you can then ter take those, uh, those paychecks or what have you and then import... Uh, you know, goods and knowledge and whatever else you need to pay your bills and whatever else, you know, savings of capital and so forth and whatever else you're doing in your personal life that will not go into here publicly. Okay. So you're doing import export right now. I, I am. Yes. But I, I, I don't want to use like a nine to five job as an example for, for Vanu because then pretty much anybody could be, you know, doing import export. And yeah. Uh, from the definition, they very well could be, but, uh, but uh, not uh, there, there's not that, you know, that, Philosophical or ideological, you know, and and hey, there's and, um, and so, hey, there's also so those that, taxes. That, that's, kind of, that's kind of that's kind of putting it too simply. It, it's it's almost uh, it's almost akin to, you know, calling everyone who uh, you know buys something from a garage sale an agorist. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I I know what you mean. I know what you mean. But you know, I, I will just uh, just to point that out for the listeners. Uh, you know, I, I I just say that you know that's <laughs> everyone would be a Vanu. Everyone well, not maybe not a Vanu specifically, but everyone would be, would be participating in import export. Uh, if that was kind of the baseline, but uh, it, yes, you, you are correct. But uh, <laughs> I think I think that's that's a that's that's a little a little too a little little oversimplification. If you if just just as my, my thoughts. And and it's it's definitely uh, not exactly the, uh, the 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 context of which Rayo is offering it, right? Because of course, to use the nine to five as an example, right? There's all sorts of taxes and regulations, what the agorists would call white market, right, as opposed to gray market. 
Um, mm -hmm. There's all of that. So yes, your criticism actually is well founded because you're basically pointing out that describing a nine to five um, is a, uh, uh, just over broke. That's how I think about jobs, folks. That a nine to five just over broke is basically the same as exporting labor. It's like, I uh, arguably, but then you also have to consider, you know, the taxes, federal income tax, social security taxes, this tax, that tax, all of the regulations, never mind, oh, yeah, the lack of privacy at work, which I know a lot of people are concerned about, workplace surveillance and a couple other things related mm -hmm. to that. Uh, whenever you fill out job applications and you have job interviews, let's go through your entire history. Ever since you were in diapers, sometimes it feels that invasive and so forth. Um so, yes, you know what, Shane? I will take your criticism on the chin. You're actually right. <laughs> as, as, an, as an example, another example of import-export, I don't think it was bad, but I, I want to just make, make, make that point very clear that, uh, no, not the baseline, not the baseline. But, yeah, let's, let's, let's begin to close out here. So it's not so much as, you know, opposing the state, uh, but the broader issue is avoiding the servile society. As I kind of just mentioned, you know, you know limiting my time in the servile society. I spent a lot of time at home. When I'm not at work, I'm 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 here at home, you know, working. After I get off work, right? Because uh, that's life in the alternative media. I'm either doing that or you know, uh, going down to our property and saying, "I don't know why." I don't do a whole lot because I try to limit my interaction with the servile state of society. Not, I mean, uh, yeah, sure. Obviously, the invulnerability coercion aspect is is, is you know, obviously like the the point of the show. But it's also you know, I don't like being there. So yeah, avoiding the servile society. And it's also you know, getting away from bullshitters and sheep people, as as Rayo called them, and and uh. Uh, <laughs> in, in his book, uh, there, there's a massive cultural difference. Now, uh, like Kyle and I, uh, when we have uh, discussions, uh, we don't. Uh, I mean, small talk may consist of a very small, small fraction of the conversation, but generally, you know, we're we're talking shop, uh, ninety ninety five percent of the time. When you go out to the servile society, I mean, uh, yeah, if you're going out, go out around election time, uh, yeah, you're talking about politics and who uh, who they're going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, who they hope will be their next uh, slave master. Uh, it's a massive cultural difference. The What's what's discussed? Uh, what you want to discuss? If 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 you are you know a Vanuan or you know even just you know a proprietary anarchist or something like that, a lot of those conversations probably won't interest you at all. Uh, I know I know they don't uh, don't really interest me much uh, much uh, much either. So hi, you're mentioning time preference. Yes, yes, I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> Any thoughts on that one? No, just that you're mentioning time preference for all of the Austro libertarian fans in the crowd. Just just saying that. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, and Kyle, you, you kind of mentioned earlier on about, uh, you know, uh, you don't like uh, the, the atmosphere of grocery stores, but uh, uh, you, you've got, uh, I, I guess, you, you have an issue with consumerism, and I, I do too to some extent. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, I am practicing frugality now, but, uh, but uh, I mean, consumerism would be crucial to the servile society, wouldn't it? Yes, and remember, consumerism is actually anti-free market because it's all about tricking people to engage in conspicuous consumption, or as Tyler Durden from Fight Club put it, another fictional thing, of course, uh, basically it's about tricking people into, buy, into working jobs they hate, into buying shit they don't need in order to impress people they don't like. OK, it's a con game. In other words, it's a, it's a form of fraud, but it's one that people kind of voluntarily kind of I say that with gritted teeth. It's true, but I don't like saying it, but it's true that people voluntarily allow themselves to be tricked because it appeals to their base desires about, ooh, shiny new car. Ooh, there's someone, uh, you know, someone who's presumably uh, attractive of the opposite sex. Sorry, folks, most people are heterosexual. Uh, ooh, someone who's attractive of the opposite sex with the makeup or bulging muscles, if that's your thing, or whatever. Um, or or the big, big house with a 30-year mortgage attached to it and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, whatever is whatever is promoting that kind of blind consumerism where – and here's the part where the fiscal conservatives in the crowd should really care about. It's all about putting people in debt, okay? And so you can't really claim to value even the notion of freedom – an absence of coercion. You can't even really claim to value freedom of any kind if uh, you're basically kind of saying, well, consumerism is like this this version of market activity when in fact it's not. It's all about tricking people into doing, making foolish dis uh, purchasing decisions so that they'll be put into debt to banks who, oh, by the way, are and all I mean, part of, of the Federal Reserve System. Anyway, I mean, come on, people, wake up. Yeah, two points. I don't know how many. Uh, first one, I don't know how many fiscal conservatives are going to be listening to the Vani podcast. Hopefully, there's some out there. Uh, if you are, just get uh, let, let us know. I'd, I'd like to know more about our audience. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it, 
And then, and then second, Kyle, I mean, uh, uh, con, uh, you know, consumerism would, would kind of be, uh, uh, I guess, obviously, it's, a, it's adaptable to, you know, your, your, your lifestyle. But, uh, but I would say that, you know, consumerism is, is, is anti vanu especially when you consider the debt aspect. Oh, yeah. Um, now, uh, now, like, if, like, let's say you're vanuing in cities, which we'll get to later on. And you have, uh, uh, actually, we'll, start, we'll talk about it a little bit in the next episode, uh, one kind of example of this. Now, if, you have a, if you're vanuing in a city and you uh, are an industrial park and you have, like, an underground hidden apartment or something, and you have a lot of really, really nice stuff there, I mean... Okay, like that. that I, I wouldn't, you know, I, like if, if that's your thing, and you know, you, you like, uh, you like, uh, you like, you know, spending money on that sort of on that sort of stuff. I, would, you know, that that that, that would, I, I'd say that would that 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 would still be Vanu, but uh, I I'd find it hard to uh, believe that uh, if you're doing like the tiny house thing, or if you're uh, you know doing van nomadism, or uh, what Rayo did in the polyethylene A10, everything was pretty much stored in your pickup truck. Uh, whenever you're whenever you're relocating it. I'd have a hard time believing that you could, like, you know, pack all that shit up and, like, move quickly. Because, you know, mobility was very important to Rayo uh, as far as, you know, being invulnerable to coercion. So, um, obviously, that the points you brought up, Kyle, I think are, are fair and valid. Um, but also just, you know, you know, relating this strictly to, to Vanu, I think there, there there's also that issue there. Uh, and I don't, I just don't think consumerism is, is really possible, except for that one example I mentioned about monitoring in cities. Right, and and interesting, you mentioned the mobility. Yeah, it's a little hard, ladies and gentlemen, to have any sort of real mobility if all if all or nearly all of your earthly possessions basically are so numerous and vast that they fill up every nook and cranny of a Mick mansion. Okay, so as much as I personally don't exactly. Um, care for the so-called minimalists i will say this i think the minimalists were right in the sense of like paring your possessions down to the extent because and this is something they don't say is actually it helps you be more mobile and so in a kind of roundabout way the minimalists actually work to be perfectly fair we're actually correct in saying that you know maybe you should consider having less possessions rather than more now obviously they they get a little mystical for my tastes and and some other directions, which tend to be more uh, a little bit to the left there, right? Just a little bit. Um, but I would say, like, yeah, you were mentioning mobility. Yeah, it's a little hard to to be mobile, you know, with a with a van or a truck or much of anything else, if if basically you ha you're basically essentially hoarding. I hate to use that term. I can't think of how else to put it. But essentially hoarding all of this junk, all of this stuff that you're not even using regularly, but you're just stuffing because, as some of the minimalists also correctly say, you don't have meaningful relationships with other human beings. So instead you've chosen, chosen voluntarily to basically a lot of times go into debt in order to have these pseudo non-relationships with these friggin' cheap Chinese crap. I'm sorry. It's about time yeah. some a few people have had a stern talking to. And for those of you, you know, listeners of ours, if you happen to know somebody who's got really nasty credit card debt because they just buy, 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 send them a copy of this episode because they need to hear this. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think I'll, one kind of final final point to mention here is this is about import export. Um, now, I, I would I would say you know, uh, kind of you know, thinking about this now. Most stuff you would purchase from the the servile society would be out of necessity. Uh, now, uh, now I imagine uh, like if Freo could come across like a, I don't know, let's just say like an alternative, you know, like a you know parallel universe, and uh, he could have come across like a laptop or something. I got my, I think he might have like splurged at that opportunity or something. Um, a lot of it's out of necessity, and then also you know just tools that you know could potentially you know help further develop Vanu. Uh, so it, it's not the it's it's not the consumerist notion of you know like uh, you know just one 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 it's not uh, crucial it's not crucial at all it's just you know spending money for, for the sake of spending money. Uh, I I think there, there there could be a little bit a little bit of you know splurging like uh as it, like in, in you know uh, uh like for Rayo again like if he could have like bought a laptop or uh you know what was the evolution after a typewriter. Actually, that wouldn't be very funny because you know those those big ass computers that they used to have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess not that very mobile maybe, at the very least. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's a bad example. But, <laughs> but again, if there if there's a tool that you know could further develop Vanu, uh, I I I think like you know for me personally, I'd probably you know invest in that if I had the money. I think Rayo would have too. Um, but it's uh, I guess it's kind of, it's not premised about uh, premised around you know want. It's premised around necessity and what can further develop Vanu. Uh, you know, for just just in my personal opinion. Well, yes. And so really all I'm saying is that when it comes to one's, you know, private property and your own personal possessions and so forth, just be very 
not to get spiritual on anybody, but be very mindful and conscientious about what property you do own. Because if you do decide to engage in venuance, one thing that you're going to have to make a decision on, and many of you will probably go this way, is that you'll want to be more mobile than not. And if you do choose to go mobile, especially in the form of country shopping, although not limited to that, right, because there's also van nomadism, is that if you do choose to be more mobile, you can't have that many things. I'm sorry. The minimalists were right about that. You cannot move around easily if you have literally thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of stuff to your name. So there is a reason for uh, you know, certain technologies that have been developed to help facilitate uh, individual uh, selling off of people's you know, garage sales like digitally online and such. So there's a reason why a lot of that was developed was because people were trying to pare down so they could be more mobile for one reason or another. And a lot of times it was so that they could have better, uh, uh, more freedom or, as for our purposes, better Vanu. Indeed, indeed. So I guess just just one of the things, as we've said many times, I mean, the choice is up to you. No one's, you know, forcing you to live in the cities. No one's forcing you to, you know, remain vulnerable to coercion. Uh, obviously, uh, there's, there's some of that that's out of your control, you know, especially legal exercises and things. But uh, as we kind of said, generally, uh, generally, I mean, the choice is up to you. If you want more freedom, if you want uh, if you want more freedom, if you want to become uh, more invulnerable to coercion, uh, the choice is yours. I mean, there, there are options out there. Uh, and obviously, it's still me. I mean, this is this is real developed this uh for 15 or so years uh, and wrote about it and he continued that continued after that i would presume we don't know for sure but uh, i mean this is something that can be further further developed and uh uh yeah i mean the choice is yours the choice is yours right and and one thing also i'd like to add too if if people want to kind of conceptualize the servile society in the form of an equation i think it would probably be best to consider it this way and obviously, this is obviously tying into the three previous episodes we've done. Political crusading plus controlled schizophrenia plus collective movementism equals the servile society. Yes, and you guys probably figure out why we laid out the episodes in this way, huh? <laughs> there was a reason, folks. There was a reason from A to B to C to D and so forth, right? So... I mean, the servile society is the enemy of venuance. I mean, that's just straight up what it is. And I, and you know what? I wish life wasn't like this. I wish our fellow, our fellow humans weren't so easily willing to coerce their fellow man. I can wish, I can wish, I can wish all I want, but wishing doesn't make it so. This is the world as it is. A is A. And so the only question then at that point is how do you deal with it? And hence, Vanu, and of course, TVP. Indeed, and well said. Well said. So, uh, that's all we have for you. The website is vanupodcast.com. That's spelled V as in victory, O, and as in Nancy, U, vanupodcast.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you next week.